If you've been in the online music community for any period of time, you've almost definitely seen this pretty infamous 4chan music chart floating around, or at least some variation on it. It's a pretty common tool that's often used by new music listeners to get into music as a whole. It definitely helped me to build up my own repertoire, which gave me an easy jumping off point to find other music that might be to my taste. With many of these albums being so influential to myself and to many others, I thought it would be fun to look back and try and do some form of retrospective or review on a bunch of these records. I'm probably not going to do all of them. If you look at this list, there's certainly a ton to go through, but I'd like to get a series going in which I talk a little bit about which ones of these resonate with me and maybe eventually which ones that don't. In this video, I'll be starting with the first block, which is made up of 15 albums, so definitely more than enough content to work with for now. I mean, look at the length of the video. We'll go in order of appearance from left to right, and I'll have a little card at the end of each one showing my score and some of my favorite tracks. First, let's get started with the big one. There aren't very many records that have been memed to the extent that this one has. There's the screaming at the beginning of I love you, Jesus Christ, to the semen stains the mountaintops, to just the inherent blank canvas of an album cover. There's so much potential here for things to latch on to, and it's no wonder 4chan took to it the way that they did. It's a match made in heaven. I think Aeroplane feels a little different though. Neutral Milk Hotel wasn't a complete unknown by the time 4chan picked it up. I mean, there were certainly people in the indie scene who'd been passing it around, but there was something special about the way that 4chan latched on the way they did and made it their own and made it an integral part of their culture and their music discourse. It often gets mockingly labeled the 4chan album, and it's correct, but it's hard to overstate just how important this album was to the community in the early 2000s, before this album had really received the cult classic status and critical reevaluation it deserved. It's definitely the epitome of this chart, and nothing else could ever really fill its shoes, I don't think. As for the actual content of this record, I can't really overstate how much this record means to me personally. I know it sounds tacky, given everyone seems to have some story about how this record personally touched them in some way, but I think that's the point. Not only is nearly everyone who enjoys this record touched by it, but I think we're all kind of touched in different ways and for different reasons. What it does for me is, well, kind of everything, but if I had to really focus in on one thing as my quote-unquote favorite element, it would absolutely be the lyrics. There's a really fantastic emotional potency in both his vocal delivery and just the way that Jeff Mangum uses words that, despite being largely nonsensical, manages to evoke such an acute emotional reaction, as well as some superbly vivid imagery. As joke-worthy as the aforementioned semen lyric is, it's such a potent image and it stands out among dozens of other quotables that are etched permanently into my brain. Lyrics about making fetuses with flesh-licking ladies and watching your brains fall out through your teeth, they're all incredibly disturbing, and yet they paint these fascinating pictures in your mind that just make it impossible to forget, and the way they're delivered feels just so disconnected from the absurdity of it all that you can't help but fall into Jeff Mangum's really cursed world. Of course, I'd be remiss not to mention the instrumental aspects of the record especially given how integral to the songs they are. It's easy to dismiss at first as just some basic four chords folk that anyone could learn in an afternoon, and that's not exactly inaccurate, but there's so much more to it than that. The simplicity of the guitars combined with the lo-fi production aesthetics and all of it works seamlessly with some of the more out there instrumentation that includes horns, some singing saws, bagpipes, and a bunch more instruments whose individual contributions are sparse, but they have this fantastic emotional impact when they land. The hang up for most people who can't seem to get into this record is pretty much always Jeff Mangum's vocals. He's 
not exactly a good singer by any technical metric, and his belted delivery can absolutely be grating at times, notably on Two-Headed Boy. But there's a very human quality to it that resonates with me in a very real way, giving it this really intimate feeling that I think is kind of unique in its execution, and it's one I haven't really been able to find anywhere else. This is one of my favorite records, and as much as I love to hate 4chan, they did get this one right. It's unfortunate that it's been made as infamous as it is by association, but this is a 10 for me, and an essential classic. To this day, there's still nothing that quite sounds like those first four alien notes that open Kid A. It's a sound I've never heard quite replicated, and the cold, really desolate tone it sets for the record is completely flawless. I'll keep it straight with you, this was my favorite album of all time until relatively recently, and even then, I think this still takes the number two spot. It's Radiohead's best record, only kind of closely approached by In Rainbows, and it's a record that simultaneously manages to be really cold and clinical, while also being incredibly emotive and passionate. It's abstract and experimental while remaining accessible enough to be one of the best-selling records the band ever released, and I think both because of and in spite of these things, it comes out on top as one of the best albums ever released, at least in my opinion. It's pretty well known and documented now how surprising of a left turn this was for the band, coming off the heels of the artsy but solidly rock-focused OK Computer and crossing out most of the sonic elements of that record, in particular the guitars, and instead replacing them with these synthetic soundscapes that give this record its really unique vibe. When guitars do show up, with the exception of one track, they're delegated to the minute and tiny details that flesh out these layered and intricate instrumentals. In general, it's kind of hard to describe what any one instrument sounds like on here, because each one is used in a different way on each track. For example, the bass is most notably used as the driving force behind the really enthralling and cacophonous national anthem. but on how to disappear completely, it takes an almost jazzy feel with a walking bass line steadily complementing the almost dream pop atmosphere of the track. Synths and machine drums are used for both cold and desolate soundscapes like on Tree Fingers and the title track, but they also, somewhat ironically, give the warm and welcoming feel to a track like Idiotech, which is a track about global warming. There's just so much to unpack with this one, and as a piece of art to dissect, it can be incredibly dense, especially on a production level, but even as a generally consumable piece of music, it's just amazingly competent, and it levels out its experimentation with its accessibility in a way that is surprisingly easy to digest. There's so, so much more I could say about this one, but I feel like everything I, I have said and that I could say has already been said before. This is another 10 and a top 5 record of all time for me. If you want to talk about albums that sound like their covers, this has to be the prime example of that. I mean, look at this and listen to this. I mean, shoegaze as a genre had existed in some form for a couple of years prior to Loveless coming out, but nothing had reached this level of both representation and quality of the genre, and frankly, I still don't think anything has. Now, 
let me be clear right out of the gate. I still don't think I get this album the way a lot of people do. I love it a lot, and I absolutely see it as one of the most important and influential musical recordings of all time, but I still don't feel that I totally grasp exactly what makes this record so personally appealing to myself and to others. In spite of that, I'm gonna try my best to give a vague approximation of what I think makes this record so special, at least to me. If you're a massive fan of this record, though, please feel free to explain what makes it so great to you in the comments because I really want to know more about this one. Anyways, I guess I should first give some sort of explanation of what this record sounds like. In a few words, I would probably call it suffocatingly beautiful. On its surface, it's essentially this wall of guitars that are laid in overdrive and reverb and a dozen other effects too numerous to name. For the most part, it barely even ends up sounding like guitars, especially on tracks like Blown A Wish or To Hear Knows When. Instead, it becomes this enveloping sound like a warm blanket or, as memes accurately suggest, a vacuum cleaner. Even on tracks like the opening Only Shallow and What You Want, where the guitars and instruments overall are much more defined, there's still this overwhelming soundscape that overtakes the actual noises and the notes and even the song structures being played. Beneath this wall of suffocating noise, however, is some of the most beautiful music I've ever heard. The vocals are ethereal and even haunting at times, blending in and out with the guitars and building melodies over these really ill-defined chord progressions and these stretched out harmonies. Buried under the guitar noise, there's even more melodies to be found that work seamlessly with the vocals to build a sound that is so unlike anything I've ever seen inside the genre or out. I struggle to define what exactly some of these instruments are, to be honest. I would assume that they're guitar, and from what I've read, they're all guitar, but with how affected and twisted they are, I genuinely cannot be confident in that. What I do know is that it sounds incredible, and that the trance-like state it evokes in me is unlike anything else. Even two years after hearing it first, I still can't say I fully understand Loveless, like I said, and I know for certain that I'll still be peeling back layers whenever I come back to this for years to come, but despite not getting it, it's still a record I consider to be important and one that I love a lot. This is a 9 for me for now, and part of me thinks that that could only go up with time. Much to the dismay of certain friends of mine, shout out to Peter on the Prison Moon podcast, I have never really gotten into Animal Collective. I got this record on vinyl, and I enjoyed it well enough, and I really liked how noisy and bizarre the debut was, but it kind of always just felt like psych music for stoners to me, and I guess to some extent that's kind of still the case. I mean. Take a look at this album cover, listen to the weird instrumentation, and hell, look at the genre tags. There's something about it that's always been inaccessible to me for that reason, but upon revisiting the project for this video, I think I may have misunderstood this record. See, when I first checked this record out, I went in expecting something super psychedelic and experimental, and I came out somewhat disappointed, having enjoyed the production and not much else. These past few days, though, I've learned to approach it on its own terms, as a pop album first and foremost, and it's been incredibly rewarding. Suddenly what I saw as failed experiments and boring half-steps became these interesting hooks and unique abstractions of pop formulas. It's not perfect, I think, side C on the vinyl release especially, to be disappointing, but for the most part, I think the content of this record is incredibly solid. 
Most of that is due to the production and their strange instrumentation. They take their unique brand of squishy, jangly, and watery noises, and they apply them to more accessible song structures, giving this record a sound that, while not totally unique, is still fresh enough to be recognizable in a lineup. The opening track, In the Flowers, starts off with these squishy and dark noises that progress to what sounds like a folk song that's being performed in like a cave or something, before finally erupting into this huge synth orchestra that's full of different types of percussion and just an overall triumphant sound to it. With some exception, this is pretty much the range of this record's sounds. My Girls is a super fun and energetic pop track with these really lovable woos in the chorus. Uh, Bluish is basically a more reverb-drenched version of an MGMT song. No More Run-In is a soft and rainy track that plods along with these woozy choruses. And Summertime Clothes is a super synthy banger that is possibly the most upfront track on the record with unconcealed vocals and a vibrant instrumental. It's not all hits, I'm not overly fond of the run from about guy's eyes to lying in a coma, but for the most part, it's just great pop tunes with a really fun psych twist. It's a little bizarre, I'm not quite sure why MU latched onto this one the way they did, especially because the rest of their discography feels way more up their alley, but I do think this is an incredibly solid project, and if you'd like to see my first time impressions of most of the band's discography, um, we'll be doing a podcast full series diving deep into their discography with all their studio albums over on the Prison Moon podcast. Go ahead and check that out in the description. For now, I think I'm going to give this record an 8. Talking Heads are friggin' awesome. I know it, you know it, your dad knows it, my dad knows it, even if you won't admit it. Everyone knows it deep down. You could pick almost any song and I could have a good time with it. If I had to make one complaint about the band though, it would actually be this record remaining light. Now, hold on. It's not because this record is some sort of black mark on the discography or anything, far from it actually. It's more so because this record is just so good and it honestly makes it hard to even bring myself to be bothered to listen to anything else. I mean this record is so good that I once went almost two weeks listening to it at least three times a day and yet I could probably count on one hand the amount of times I've listened to any other Talking Heads record. And honestly I don't even know if I think the songs are that much better on this one than some of the other stuff they've done. So why is it that this record is the one I've latched so hard on to? It wasn't immediately obvious to me, but now it's kind of crystal clear. It's all in the Brian Eno production. Obviously Eno is an iconic artist in his own right with legendary projects and collaborations with the likes of David Bowie under his belt. But I don't think anything else has quite hit me the way that this one has. The eccentric and really funky side of Talking Heads is complemented flawlessly by the way he makes the bass and the drumming truly pop, and it gives those instrumentals an enormous sense of scale. It's most noticeable on Once in a Lifetime, and especially The Great Curve, one of my all-time favorite songs, and what I consider to have the greatest guitar solo ever recorded. It's got this devastating and this massive sound that feeds back into itself with these crushing harmonics. When it's time to get more quiet though, like on Listening Wind and The Overload, his more experimental and especially his ambient side shine through clearly. While never overtaking the personality of the band, you can absolutely tell this is the same producer who made the four-part ambient series as these spacious and really alien soundscapes give a wholly unique and intimate power to the tracks. It's very clear that Eno worked really closely with the band and that the band in turn wrote their songs specifically with his production in mind. 
Of course, I still love other Talking Heads records for their songwriting, their energy, and their personality, but in light of this one, I can't help but feel like they're a little bit naked. And even relative to the other two records that, you know, produce for the band, there's a great sense that this is that combination's peak, and I don't think there's ever been anything like it since. This is an easy 10 here. Alright, so fair warning, we've just now entered into the circle jerk zone of some of my top five albums of all time. Yeah, I know, they're basic picks, but hopefully you'll be able to forgive me. To start, let's talk about this absolute masterpiece of a record, Spiderland by Slint. You know, I've seen people online shit on the albums I'm talking about today in pretty much every way you can imagine, all of them except for this one, and I mean I could theorize about why that is if I really wanted to, but honestly, I think it might just be that good. A few times earlier, I described Kid A as a cold album, and well I stand by that wholeheartedly, I think this one is cold to a far different degree. Where that album was sonically cold, this one manages to be emotionally cold. It feels like an entire album of disassociation from yourself and others, of isolation and of emotional disconnectedness. By blending their post-hardcore roots with the then-budding genre of post-rock, they built a combination that still feels almost completely unique to this day. There's a lot of math rock influences here, with these dizzying and looping passages that drone on and on with these alternating time signatures and accentuations. The guitars are clean for the most part with this unsettling crispness to their sound, but when the distortion kicks in, we get this buzzsaw tone that reminds me a lot of some grindcore or even black metal albums, Repulsion and Burzum respectively. The way it's played is totally different though, it lends this sharp, piercing dissonance to the really hollow sounding mix. Despite the bass and guitar being super prominent throughout the record, the mix has almost all of it scooped out and it gives it this feeling that something's wrong, something's missing. The vocals reflect this. There's basically no singing on here, instead we're left trapped with this deadpan storyteller who's quietly speaking over these solemn instrumentals, telling these esoteric stories and speaking obtuse poetry with hardly a hint of emotion. The lyrics each tell a different story, all tying to this theme of loneliness, of innocence lost, of pain left unexamined and unexpressed. The metaphors go fairly deep on this one, but even on a surface level, there's a lot to glean from the raw stories being told, from the bizarre and childlike roller coaster story on Breadcrumb Trail to the really terrifying sinking of the ship in Good Morning Captain. Everything is delivered with utmost conviction, and even though it's deadpan, it's absolutely not bored. The vocals being so low in the mix has two effects for me. For one, it forces me to listen closer and to catch all these little details and give me a greater appreciation for the music surrounding. Secondly, it just gives this amazing potency for when that deadpan delivery is broken, like the real singing on Washer and the devastating screaming explosion on the closer. It's hard to overstate just how perfectly the vocals work here, no matter what they're doing. And I think just to this day, there really isn't anything like Spiderland, by Slint or otherwise. Sure, it's definitely been influential on plenty of records, even up to this year, but I don't think anything will ever hit the way that this record does. Another 10, and just an impeccable work of art. Feel alibis in an ancient tongue 
for the court of the crimson. It's really interesting to look at the timeline of rock around the time of this first King Crimson album's release, because it's kind of shocking to see how many things Court of the Crimson King did first. It had pummeling metal riffs a year before Black Sabbath, it for all intents and purposes started prog rock, and it was even right on the cusp of things like jazz rock and free improvisation in rock music. In 1969, music just didn't sound like this, and it's really hard to overstate what a game changer King Crimson was at the time. But what about now? I mean, it's been half a century since this thing released. You'd think it'd sound at least a little bit aged, right? Well, to put it bluntly, no. Court of the Crimson King sounds as fresh today as it must have back in the day, and in some respects, maybe even better given the hindsight on where music went past this point. Part of the reason that prog doesn't always work for me is that a large sum of it can be described as technical ability with no soul. Too much prog that I grew up with is just guitar whizzes jerking themselves off for nine minutes at a time and cashing in a check. Not all of it, of course. There are obvious exceptions like Yes and Pink Floyd, but a vast majority of what I've heard is more interesting to me as a musician than as a listener, which is never what I want unless I'm learning to play songs on an instrument. Technical proficiency comes second to enjoying songwriting for me, always. So I guess take everything I just said negative about prog and throw it all out the window because this is not only the best prog album I've ever heard, but it's also just one of the best albums I've heard, period. It's kind of surprising to see how much this stands head and shoulders above even the best prog from the time, and given how early it came along, I'd expect it to have been topped eventually, but if it has, I can't find it. I think part of the reason for that is that a lot of this album's best elements haven't really translated over to the broader canon of the genre. Particularly, there's the free jazz and the symphonic instrumentation. Of course, you can find those elements individually in Prague all over the place, but I find that there's a surprisingly low amount of bands that have really tried to replicate what King Crimson did here, for better or worse. As for the actual music, I mean, of course it's incredible. There are very few bands with such an awesome catalog of music as King Crimson, and they started off with their biggest bang. The album opens with the crushing 21st Century Schizoid Man, a track filled with the aforementioned heavy metal riffs, massively distorted vocals, and some of the most fun instrumental breaks in the genre. It's shocking, then, how different the following I Talk to the Wind is, acting as a far more reserved and emotionally intimate moment on the record, showing off Greg Lake's incredible vocals. Similarly, Epitaph is this massive track of truly epic proportion. Lake's vocal range is put to perfect use here, and the swelling instrumentation gives it a devastating hit of emotion. Moonchild is the black sheep, often landing itself as people's least favorite because of its overblown length and wandering pace, but I think it's an absolutely essential moment, and the free instrumentation is one of the best mood pieces I've heard. The title track then brings us home with one of the best closers ever made. It's got a sprawling length and just seamlessly transitions through various movements to tell this very epic tale of betrayal and of death. And so, even aside from the unmistakable influence, Court of the Crimson King remains one of the greatest albums ever released, and a standing testament to the heights that music can reach with the right balance of artistry and ability. It's a 10.
if I've pretty much ever spoken to you about music before, you already know what I'm about to say. Say it with me. This is my favorite album of all time. So, yeah. I'm kind of in love with this record. I've talked about it on podcasts, I've said it on stream, I've tried writing about it on more occasions than I can count, and now here I am, finally attempting to put my thoughts on this thing into a semi-formal review. Where do I even start? I guess it all comes back to faith, doesn't it? I can pinpoint the exact moment that I realized this was my favorite album. It was two in the morning. I was laying in the dark, playing my vinyl copy as I fell asleep. It was the summer of 2020, and I was in a state of emotional turmoil, though it would take me a few months beyond then to admit that. In particular, questions of, of faith, of sexuality, and of gender expression were taking up a massive amount of my mental capacity, and I was spending most days stressed about various things that acted as outlets for my actual frustrations that I was failing or refusing to acknowledge. So here I am. I've just flipped from side A to B. After being devastated by the crushingly gorgeous pianos at the end of Storm, and I'm greeted with this. Where they sat, where they are. When you penetrate to the Most High God, you will believe you're mad. You will believe you've gone insane. But I tell you, if you follow the secret window and you die in ego nature, you will penetrate this darkness. Oh, you are in the understanding of God, because when you see the face of God, you will die, and there will be nothing left in you except the God-man, the God-woman, the heavenly man, the heavenly woman, the heavenly child. There'll be prayer. It was crushing. I was being faced with all of these feelings about religion and faith in a way that I never had before, and consequently about my own identity. As I thought deeply and contemplated these feelings, the music seemed to accompany me with these blistering climaxes and these unsettled valleys of ambient sound. It's a moment that has never left me, and it's almost certainly the most emotionally intense memory I have connected with music. For the rest of that summer, and ever since, I've delved into this record time and time again, digging for more details and more little pieces to put together, and I'm yet to leave dissatisfied. Godspeed are a band that are unlike anything that I have ever heard. They make post-rock, but they do it in a way that is just so different from anything else in the field. They expand on the concept of the genre and build it out into these gargantuan and cinematic epics that are evocative as any film or piece of visual media. Their music is massive and conceptual. Here, it's split into four gargantuan 20-minute pieces with multiple movements, 10 instrumentalists all working together to create these interwoven and colorful songs that stretch genre's definitions to their limits, equally as impactful in their quiet and somber moments as they are in their bombast. It's hard to think of a band that can play to so many extremes with such precision and care and a sense of chemistry across so many members. On Skinny Fists, the tracks are filled with these little field recording interludes that generally fall at the beginnings and ends of tracks. These give a sense of narrative to the pieces and make what might otherwise be just fantastic instrumentation into a truly otherworldly experience that forces you to confront some very dark and very core elements to humanity. As I've mentioned, the second track, Storm, forces you right away to focus on themes of religion and faith with these dark and harrowing instrumentals that culminate in one of my favorite guitar solos I've ever heard. The opening track, Storm, doesn't open with a field recording, instead saving it for the end, but it paints an incredibly dystopian image of late-stage capitalism and its effect on human interaction. 
Sleep, the third track, has always been about climate change in my mind, with the opening They Don't Sleep Anymore on the Beach recording, and it's particularly notable line of now it's shrunk down to almost nothing. The track's two climaxes ring equally powerful, with one being this harsh and explosive moment, and the other being a more reserved segment with maybe my favorite drum line of all time. I could go on and on about this album forever. I've already done so for over an hour on my podcast, so you can check that out. But needless to say, this is a 10. This is the 10. And the best and most impactful thing I've ever listened to. I honestly wonder if anything can ever top it. I'm living in that 21st century, doing something mean to it. Do it better than anybody you ever seen. Do it. Screams from the haters. Got a nice ring to it. I guess every superhero needs I don't think I need to be the one to tell you this, but Kanye's Dark Twisted Fantasy, pretty good album. Obvious statements aside, though, it's pretty obvious why this record took off and blew up the way that it did. It was the triumphant return of Rap's prodigal son after a critical dud and the infamous VMA incident had seemingly sullied his reputation. And when I say triumphant, I mean it. I think Twisted Fantasy may be the most expensive sounding album I've ever heard with maximalist production, dozens of features, expensive samples, and this overall vibe of extravagance unlike anything I've seen. With that level of unique energy and the overall impact it's had, it's not hard to see why this album is up here. It's no doubt one of the better hip-hop albums released in its decade, topping many lists, including winding up in my now outdated top 10 albums list. I still hold to this being incredibly good, but I will say that for a couple of key reasons, it lands around the number five spot in my ranking of Kanye projects. I'll get to those in a second, but first, let's talk about the good stuff. For one, the production. I already said this is one of the most expensive sounding records I've ever heard, but I feel like I need to emphasize that because the competition isn't even close to be honest. The beats are super lush and glamorous with the massive opener and its layered synths, xylophone lead, and the choirs on the chorus to the piercing piano on Runaway that acts as the driving force for one of the most beautiful beats of Kanye's career. Lead single Power has tons of samples with the chanting under the verses and of course the 21st century schizoid man sample that no doubt introduced many people to the band. The biggest moment of extravagance for me though is All of the Lights. It's got this huge orchestral intro, massive blaring horns, really dirty bass, and an absurd list of features from Rihanna, Kid Cudi, and Drake, to Elton John, Fergie, and Alicia Keys. And that's just on one track. The rest of this album is just so packed with monster containing verses from Rick Ross, Jay-Z, and of course Nicki Minaj. So Appalled has Pusha T, RZA, and more, and Gorgeous has Kid Cudi and Raekwon. These are just the ones listed on the Spotify tracklist as well. There's so many more who aren't, and the fact that Kanye managed to pull together so many artists and still maintain such a level of quality from each is really impressive. They don't all work as well as each other, but nobody ruins the track they're on, or even delivers a shoddy verse. The real reason we're here is for Kanye, though. I mean, this is his triumphant return from his self-imposed exile, after all. And while I think I still prefer the youthful personality that just made music because he loved music, there's something deeper here, and it really feels like a further view into the highs and lows of fame and how it's impacted him. Where 808s was darker and more depressed given the circumstances, Twisted Fantasy is far more egocentric with an overconfident Kanye on tracks like Power, Gorgeous, and Devil in a New Dress. The really interesting part of this record for me though is how those highs contrast with the crushing and intimate lows that go deeper into Wes's insecurities about himself as an artist, as a lover, and as a friend. 
We see this most on later tracks like Runaway and Blame Game, where he really wears his heart on his sleeve and tears himself down in a way that we don't see very often. It's a contrast that could otherwise be jarring, but I think given the maximalist production to even the more intimate moments, it works out great. This album isn't perfect, I think So Appalled goes a little too long and the really irritating skit on Blame Game soils what is otherwise one of my favorite tracks, but given how many pieces are in play and how high its aspirations are, it's really an impressive feat. This one is a 9 for me. I already talked a fair bit about this in my Getting Into Death Grips video, so I'll keep this relatively brief, but needless to say I love this record. It's easy to look at this album as overrated in their catalogue given how accessible it is compared to the rest of their albums, but that certainly doesn't make it any worse in my opinion. In fact, there's a certain genius to how poppy this record is. Right from the start, the album hooks you in with Get Got, a relatively chill song that eases you into the weirder production on the record without overloading you right away with the freakier vocals and synth tones that show up later on the record, including the next track, The Fever. This one is kind of like being pushed into the water after dipping your toes in with Get Got. Its production stays relatively safe, not quite showing its hand of how bizarre it can get. Like I mentioned in my other video, the key element is hooks, which this album has in spades. I can look at this track list and instantly remember the chorus of every single track and get it stuck in my head. For a project so experimental, that's pretty impressive. The frenetic energy continues throughout, and it's easily heard in both MC Ride's vocals and his lyrics. Paranoia is the key word here, with themes of general distrust in other people, in technology, and in himself. The lead single, I've Seen Footage, seems to be about accidentally seeing a video of someone dying online and becoming increasingly obsessed with it and all the little details around it. Hacker has always read to me as something of a warning about the impact pop culture has on us and our perception of the world, and how easy it would be for anyone who wanted to to reach you. Despite how bizarre and sometimes goofy the lyrics are, it's always a joy to try and read more into them because there's no shortage of new stuff to find there. This one's a 9 for me. It's not the band's best in my opinion, but it's definitely a highlight and an important album for hip hop history. Despite not actually listening to it very much at the time, though I wish I had, this is the quintessential summer 2020 album for me. I remember I would take three hour plus long walks in the dead of the night and the earliest hours in the morning completely alone and uninterrupted, just thinking. I would listen to an assortment of albums, not just this one, but looking back, none were nearly as appropriate as American Football's first. When I listened to American Football for the first time, I certainly liked it, but I didn't understand the appeal or why I saw a lot of people talking about it in terms of emotional impact. For me, it was a sweet little album with pretty technical guitars, a really clean sound, and a nostalgic vibe to it. In the context of those late summer nights of isolation though, everything feels completely different. The feelings of aching loneliness and uncertainty that I saw as cliches of the genre become these painful reminders of the place I was in at the time, physically and mentally. And what's interesting is, I'm not sure what put me there, not entirely. My closest guess is it has something to do with both the production and the influences. On the surface, it's obviously a Midwest emo sound with major math rock influences, super clean guitars, intricate drumming with polyrhythms, etc. But what I think some people miss is how big a part the influences from post-rock are in both the production and the songwriting. The most obvious example to me is the track Honestly, 
where the second half consists of a gradually evolving guitar loop that grows and grows to a breaking point before ending. A similar thing can be seen in the 8 minute track Stay Home, but really, once you start looking for it, it's kind of impossible to ignore, and it makes the otherwise quite standard emo songs so much more engaging and gives them much more longevity. And honestly, I think that's what this record is to me. I don't have some long tirade about why I love it. I don't think it's the most unique or original piece of music out there. My emotional connection to it is more from association than actual experience. I just think it's a really solid Summer Nights album that makes me feel a bit sad sometimes, late at night. And I think that's the exact intention. It's gonna be an 8 from me. Lucid tentacles test, enslave, enjoin, enjointed jade pointed diamond back patterns. Neon meat dream. Prior to the writing of this video script, I had actually not listened to this record. A combination of its reputation, its length, and the fact that it's not on Spotify just kind of kept me away until now, and honestly, I kind of regret it. I wouldn't necessarily say that the strangeness and the experimentation is over-exaggerated by people I've heard talk about it, but I think seeing it only through that lens kind of misses the point. Yeah, it's bizarre, yeah it breaks most of the rules of music you could think of, but I think what's actually impressive about Trout Mask Replica is that, above all else, it manages to have some really great and memorable songs on it. After I got over the initial hurdle of all the instrumentation sounding completely disparate from each other and Beefheart's vocals sounding like a drunk Red Dead Redemption character, I had no trouble finding fun in this record and just generally having a good time. It's not perfect, for one I find it to be pretty egregious in length, and the production can be a bit all over the place leaving some tracks less listenable than others. But it still feels very intentional, and whether I or anyone else enjoy it or not, this is exactly what Beefheart wanted. For such a dissonant and experimental album, you'd be surprised by how many earworm hooks there are throughout, and with so many ridiculous lines to mock and repeat over and over, it's no surprise that 4chan latched onto this one. There's the obvious fast and bulbous, as well as the neon meat dream of an octofish. There's also just a lot of goofing around throughout, which makes it a really entertaining listening experience that at times can just feel like you're hanging out with some dudes who are screwing around and cracking jokes over some improvisation. The fact that it's all heavily transposed and planned out only adds to how impressive it is that they managed to make it feel so alive. I don't quite love this record. Like I said, it's pretty overlong and it can be hard to stomach depending on my mood, but I really like it. And I think if I'm rating it, I'll give it like a seven. When I first decided to make this video, I was really nervous about this one for a few reasons. Swans is one of my favorite bands, but I'd never really given this record the time it deserves, for the most part just because of how incredibly long it is, or at least that's why I thought was why. Upon extensive re-listening for this video though, I think I've come to realize the real reason it took me so long to really build an appreciation for this album the way I have since. I think for the most part, it's about pacing. See, when I listen to something like To Be Kind or The Seer, there's a really great sense of flow from track to track that makes it feel like one cohesive experience, even one long two-hour track. Soundtracks is nothing like that. In fact, on a first listen, it hardly even feels cohesive at all, more like a compilation of random tracks that are strung together for two and a half hours. It was only once I started looking at it through the lens of its title that I started to click with it. It's a soundtrack to a movie that doesn't exist. 
From this perspective, not only does the complete lack of flow make perfect sense, but it also gives this air of mystery, wondering what could be happening between the tracks we hear and what the story is actually about. It also helped me understand the structure of the track list far more. The record is split across two CDs, and each one consists of a number of shorter and more unique tracks that act as the filling sandwiched between two 10 plus minute post-rock pieces at the beginning and end. Helpless Child is easily one of the band's best tracks to date, with this unmatched sense of loneliness and desperation that's perfectly brought to life by these layered acoustic guitars, the pounding drums, and a really gorgeous synth bringing it all together. Michael Jira sings here, as well as on the other three cornerstones. What's interesting though is how rare it is for us to actually hear Jira on this record. He's taking significantly more of a backseat than on any other project, instead leaning hard into instrumentals and giving a bigger spotlight to Jarbo, who would not return to the band after this album. Jarbo on this record is absolutely horrifying. From the moment we first hear her on Yum Yab Killers shrieking, blow your brains out, like an animal thrashing around to escape its cage. But a couple tracks later on Volcano, which is a complete tonal departure from the rest of the record, sounding almost like a 90s club track, and almost reminding me in a weird way of the anime Serial Experiments Elaine, Jarbo takes a far more traditionally beautiful approach crooning over these pulsating rhythms, but it's no less terrifying than anything else, as the lyrics she's singing paint these awful pictures made even more intimate by her delivery. The track Hypno Girl makes Yum Yab Gillers sound like a bedtime story though, as here she's truly devolved to her most primal form, creakily demanding various impossible and gruesome things from whoever her subject is. On her longest track here though, YRP or Your Property, she sounds utterly broken, completely subservient to some abusive force that has taken total control of her and corrupted her mind, the slowly evolving instrumental adding to the crushing weight of her words and her hollow delivery. In a lot of ways, the interlude tracks feel like a direct precursor to the sound that Godspeed would make their own on their debut a year later with these sweeping drones, these massive climaxes, and most notably, vocal field recordings and interviews. This is a technique that Godspeed used for a very different effect in their early works, generally to push an urgent political message that the listener would then use the long instrumentals to think through and examine. Swans use it similarly here, but the narrative being portrayed here is a little bit harder to parse. When I think about this record, some of the first things I think of are the words we hear at the very beginning as this criminal goes into detail about the various ways that his victim is so fucked up. On the later track, The Beautiful Days, as well as again on Minus Something, we hear a phone sex operator recounting their experiences in the field with the latter being a far darker depiction of some of the ways they've been made to feel uncomfortable or violated in some way. In what's likely the most quintessential piece here, How They Suffer, we get two interviews, one with Michael Jira's late father on his blindness, and one with Jarbo's mother as she recounts the beginning of her fall into dementia. Both of these interviews, to me, act as the record's driving purpose, and in looking at it specifically through the lens of this track, I think I was finally able to understand and get soundtracks for the blind. I really didn't expect to get to this point with this record, but I could not be happier. I can finally accept this one into my all-time favorites as the masterpiece that it is, and even though I really can't listen to it very often due to its length, I think it would be unfair to claim that as a fault of the record given the statement it makes and the sheer quality from front to back. I'm proud to say that Soundtracks for the Blind is my newest 10 out of 10 record. I may not always love you, but long as there are stars above you.
So here's the thing about this record. It nearly always comes up on lists of the best albums of all time, the most influential albums of all time, and I'm not about to contest that, obviously. It's an incredible record that shaped psychedelic and baroque pop for basically the rest of music history. And for a band with such a spotty catalogue up to this point, it's kind of a miracle that it even happened. What I think is especially interesting though, at least to me, is how they managed to do so much for music as a whole using just one formula on the whole record. Now, the word formulaic has some pretty bad connotations, but when I use it to describe this album, I want to make it abundantly clear that I'm only using it in the most literal sense, in that it follows a singular formula to a T. The reason I think it's so interesting, though, is just how flawlessly crafted that formula is where every single track can kind of sound exactly the same, and yet every one stands out and is catchy and memorable in its own way. It's all the same instrumentation, the song structures, the same vocal harmonies, but the thing is, that formula is just so ridiculously good that I don't even notice the similarities. There isn't a single dud on this thing, it's just hits front to back, from the opening Wouldn't It Be Nice with its high energy, its sugar-sweet vocals and lyrics, and its lush instrumental harmonies, to the more somber but equally memorable Caroline No closing us out with its somber bass and keys. God Only Knows is the biggest track here, and compositionally it's a masterpiece, the way the vocals harmonize with each other as the controlled but chaotic instrumentals build a greater sense of purpose in the track, seamlessly helping it transition from verse to chorus and back again. Here Today has a bit more of an ominous feel to its melodies, which is fitting given the forewarning theme of the lyrics, but also leads it to a quick and explosive chorus like so many others on the record. I don't have too much else to say otherwise. I'm not a music theory expert or anything, but listening to Pet Sounds, I can absolutely get at least some sort of grasp on why the compositions work as well as they do. The harmonies are incredibly memorable and distinct on this record, the youthful energy is endearing, and above all, the songwriting is just absurdly tight. This is a 9 out of 10 for me. So we finally made it to the last record here, and it's a doozy. Not only is it the most influential album on this list easily, it's also a top contender for most influential album of all time. When Brian Eno wrote about the Velvet Underground and Nico, he described it as the moment that proved that rock music could be art. It revolutionized the way that music could portray things as core as emotions and atmosphere, and literally made hundreds of thousands of albums down the road possible, including most of the ones we've talked about today. To put it one way, this is the record for overdosing in New York City. It's dark, it's grimy, it's disaffected, and yet there's a sense of excitement and naive disregard for consequence throughout. For every heroin or Black Angel's death song, there's a cheerier Sunday morning or femme fatale to counter it, contrasting the harsher and less concrete instrumentation with far more blissful moments, especially helped by Nico's gorgeous and angelic voice. Lou Reed also completely makes the record, with his undeniable charisma that makes up for and enhances his more spoken vocal delivery, and he goes on about the more grimy elements of life that weren't really given much spotlight in music at the time, if any. Stuff like addiction, prostitution, and all kinds of desperation is given at face value with no smoke and mirrors that are masquerading it for what it really is. The instrumentals here are totally of the time, and yet still hold up relatively well today. There's some obvious production flaws as can be expected, but they only enhance the noisier tracks by giving them an extra layer of cacophony, especially on the final two tracks and the aforementioned Heroin, a track I'd like to talk about for a second because not only is it a definitive track of the record, I'd say it's one of the definitive tracks of the 60s. It takes the clean instrumentals you would hear on a more typical rock song of the time and gradually taints it, 
building and breaking into a sound that mimics the feeling of an actual overdose, the muted bass drum acting as a heartbeat, gradually increasing in speed faster and faster and faster and faster and, faster and getting drowned out by the more and more harsh distortion, unlike anything else at the time before eventually collapsing into another cycle that repeats over and over until the track just dies off. If I have a complaint about this record, it's more so just how the band improved on it going forward. White Light, White Heat is basically everything I love about and Nico, but done better, where the self-titled takes the pop rock elements and perfects those. This is the best we'd ever see those sounds combined though, and I still don't think they ever managed to top the blistering heights of heroin. I have nothing but the utmost respect for this record, I just have to admit that there are other Velvet Underground records I'd rather be listening to sometimes. Still, a really strong 8 out of 10 here, and an absolute essential. And so now here we are. We're an hour later, almost exactly, and we've reviewed 15 of the most talked about albums that are already out there. Have we learned something? I mean, maybe. I guess, above all, we've learned that for as awful a place as 4chan is and for as toxic of an environment it can be online, they do have a pretty good taste in music and a taste that I think properly represents a lot of what music as an art form can be, even if it is absolutely a circle jerk. I do honestly believe that this Mew Essentials chart is one of, if not the best way to get into music as a new listener and to start developing your own taste, so long as you actually do go beyond this chart and don't stick around with this kind of limited selection. If you already knew all these records, then I hope you at least got some enjoyment out of my almost half movie reviewing them, but if not, well, I'll have time to do better next time. Stick around on my channel for more stuff like reviews, we'll be doing some video essays, hopefully I can get some camera on vinyl related stuff. I've opened up a Patreon because this was a lot of work and I don't intend on lowering my workload past this point, so if you like what I do, want to support it, the link's right there. Either way, I'll see you around. Thanks.